Hi, guys. Thanks for that warm welcome. This is actually my second year at UXSEA. The room is so much more full this year. It's really exciting. I'd also like to welcome up Matt, my co-speaker. You, you get a little two-for-one deal here. Tag team. Yeah. Uh, so just a quick introduction. My name is Caitlin Robinson, and I'm the head of experience design at Money Smart. And my name is Matt Lambie, and I'm the CTO at Money Smart. So we just wanted to take a bit um, and explain a little bit about who Money is Smart is because I think this is what sets the stage for what we're about to tell you, right? We're here to empower everybody with the information, tools, and ultimately advice they need to make the best financial decisions possible. Um, the reality is in today's day and age, that task is actually incredibly complicated. More so, we might argue, than it needs to be. But I think when we talk to our customers, at the end of the day, we're trying to help them make incredibly complex decisions. So as a part of that, our team has been working really hard to develop tools and techniques to ultimately try to make these complex decisions manageable. And for us, that's not about simplification and reduction, because we really feel like that um, ignores important components and variables which exist in everybody's day-to-day -day life. And instead, we're, um, uh-oh, hold up, go back, go back, go back, roll back that, roll back that time clock. Um, what we'd like to argue today, and what we'd like to talk you through is um, a process and some tips and tricks for how to manage that complexity and ultimately embrace it um, rather than trying to distill it all down and make it overly simple. Okay, why is that important though? Let's set the stage and, and go back and talk a little bit about context, right? Um, as we've heard from our first couple of speakers, we have an amazing sort of trajectory and momentum when it comes to innovation and technology. Right? And as a part of that, the types of problems which we're able to attack and go after are increasingly getting bigger and more complicated. Right? We've, we've gone from little abacus counting machines to quantum computing. And that's phenomenal. But at the end of the day, most of us end up getting really overwhelmed by a lot of this complexity. And so we become really reactive. Um, I don't know about you, but when I am bombarded with information and tasks and different approaches for how to accomplish those tasks, I become really overwhelmed, right? And I don't know about you, but I also get really exhausted by trying to make these types of decisions. Um, so when we're faced with exhaustion and we're asked to make incredibly complex decisions, what ultimately happens? Let me run you through a scenario because I know we're the last talk right before lunch, right? And everybody's stomachs are starting to get a little hungry and a little empty. Um, say you're at the end of your day or say you're right before lunch. And I give you two options to um, try to stave off that hanger. If I give you the option of a bag of Cheetos or an orange, which are you going to choose? They're both orange. They both go into your stomach. You could argue they have nutritional content, but that's a little bit debatable, right? How many of you are going to choose the orange? Liars. Okay. How many, how many of you are going to choose the Cheetos? Yeah, yeah. And you know what's really unfair is that those Cheetos have been specifically designed and engineered so that when you're in that vulnerable state, when you're exhausted, when you're hungry, it's there to beat out that orange. Let me run you through a different example. Um, how many of you guys use Apple Pay or Android Pay? Alipay, GrabPay, something like that? Okay. Of those of you who use that service, how many of you think that those services are here to make you more conscious about the money you spend? Okay, one person. Way to be the lone dissenter. I like it, I like it. We need somebody to counterbalance. I don't think that they try to make you very conscious about your spending. I actually think that they try to get you to ignore the fact that you are spending money at all. 
right? And why that becomes important is when, okay, say I'm in my afternoon slump, I need a cup of coffee, it's easier to go to Starbucks. It doesn't really go with my spending goals, my saving goals, but that's okay. Get out my Apple Pay, I'm through, I don't even feel like I've spent a dollar, right? Now, fast forward and you have a few more of those unconscious purchases and a few more of those afternoon coffees and suddenly you start to rack up a lot of credit card debt. And then perhaps you start to see your credit score go down, which, which ultimately impacts what you're able to do in the future. Now, I know I paid a really bleak picture after a single cup of coffee in the afternoon. I own that. But I think it's an important lesson for us to keep in mind. I'm like trying to send the signal straight through you, right? Um, don't worry, you're not alone in this, this sort of reactive decision-making process. Uh, the business world, for better or for worse, is also geared towards short-term gains. I think all you have to do is dial in to an investor call, as an example. Um, you hear CEOs talking about some of our um, biggest uh, public companies, and I think that there's a crazy statistic where 80% of those CEOs would say uh, that they would sacrifice long-term economic gains in order to meet their quarterly financial targets, right? That's pretty huge. That means that they're gonna forego uh, spending on crucial infrastructure like employees, which each and every one of you should care about, and education, in order to drive revenue and sales. I think in the FinTech space, uh, we actually saw a really powerful example of that with Wells Fargo. Anybody familiar with this? As a bank, they had pretty aggressive revenue and sales targets. And so what employees did when they weren't making their quarterly numbers, they opened up accounts without consumer consent. Right? Really big deal. Really big deal. This, of course, telegraphs out when you start to think about um, the impacts that are driving our industry and decisions. And it even ladders out when you think about countries, right? A lot of countries are more concerned about their GDP than they are long-term economic infrastructure building. So why is that, right? What is contributing to this um, idea of short-term games over long-term goals? I think Dan Ariely, who is a behavioral economic, um, economist, has a great um, perspective on this. He talks about two big types of decisions. There are small decisions, like these are the ones that are built on gut reaction, right? Do I choose the orange? Do I choose the Cheetos? Right? And those are pretty easy for each of us to manage. Where it gets more complicated is the big decisions. Most of us really struggle making big decisions. And that's because they are so complex and we have to take the time to look at them and all of that complexity. We have to assess all of the different variables, understand how different cascading decisions are going to impact us down the road. And so we tend to pick up this problem and we start to look at it. And then most of us put that problem back down for a bit because it becomes too overwhelming. And then maybe we pick it back up again. We add a little bit more research and input. And finally, finally, hopefully at some point in time, after a lot of consideration and a lot of care, hopefully we finally make that decision. But do you know the funny thing about it? is that most of us make that decision from a point of trying to minimize our loss. We as humans are far more likely to make a decision that minimize our loss, our losses, versus maximizing our gains, right? So to break that down, more of us in this room would rather ensure that we don't lose the $20 that are in, that's in our wallet versus make a decision and hope that we're gonna get $100 in gain, right? Pretty impactful, pretty powerful. Whoa. And part of the reason for that is that it's really hard for us to manage out all of these different scenario trees that happen when we try to make these big decisions. If I take you way back 
And think about times when we were sitting in caves and all we were trying to do was figure out how to make sure that we had food, some sort of shelter, and ultimately a modicum of safety. The types of decisions that we were making were pretty straightforward. And yes, we started to build some tools to help us make those decisions. And then things got a little bit more complex when we started to talk about staying put, building agrarian societies, more complicated tools. Fast forward to today where we have all sorts of technologies in these big cities full of lots of different types of people and lots of different types of businesses with lots of different type of competing objectives. And the decision making is really complicated and the ways in which we can stretch out and think about the future has become even harder. The trouble is, we can't actually make a decision if we don't have a good way to make a forecast for what the impacts of that decision might look like. The good news is that today, as communities, we are trying to make decisions that far span out into the future in ways that we never have before. The fact that we're talking about AI and the singularity, that we're talking about climate change and what we can ultimately do about it, is a type of decision-making process that we haven't actually been engaging with for that long, but it shows great evolution that we are starting to try and tackle those problems. And so here it is, if you take nothing else out of this talk, which hopefully won't be the case, but start to think about this, right? How do we start to create environments that drive positive behavior change, that support us when we are tired and exhausted and ultimately overwhelmed, so that people don't fail catastrophically, so that they can see multiple different outcomes and versions of success, right? And this is important to think about, not just in our wider world and day to day, but also when we think about the design environments that we're creating how we're setting up our design teams in order to make sure that we can reach innovation and outcomes that address a diverse population and group of needs. For us at Money Smart, we think that one of the pathways to do that, to design these environments, is ultimately through collaborative storytelling, through scenario planning, through narrative development. Right? And we think that that's really important because it's not about our predictions or scenarios being right. At the end of the day, it's the fact that we are becoming more comfortable with different outcomes, that we are be becoming more comfortable with different trajectories, and that ambiguity and unpredictability are um, elements that we really start to embrace as opposed to shy away from. And that's ultimately what's been helping us start to tackle some of these big, wicked problems that industry has previously said, too big, can't do it, change isn't possible. Okay, who's familiar with the characters on the screen? Show of hands. There's going to be a lot of this show of hands nonsense, it's going to bear with me. Okay, those of you that haven't, it's a TV show on Netflix called Stranger Things. And I, I, yeah, a round of applause, yeah, well done. Um, and I, uh, it's going to be a bit of a theme that kind of runs through. If you haven't seen this TV show and you have a Netflix subscription, then watch it. If you don't have a Netflix sub subscription, get one and watch it. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Dungeons and Dragons, uh, which is a theme uh, that runs through this show from the very, very beginning, literally from the opening scene. So no spoilers, uh, but... The, this opening scene, the, the, these characters are, are all playing a, a board game, Dungeons and Dragons, or a, a role-playing game. So another show of hands. Who has any familiarity with, with D&D? Anyone? I know there's a bunch of money-smart people here that do. Yeah, put your hand up, Sam. Excellent. Um, so the best way that I've heard this described, uh, or heard Dungeons and Dragons described, is that it's collaborative storytelling. So there's no winning, there's no losing, there's just progressing through a story. Um, and as you watch Stranger Things, um, have an awareness that from the very first scene, they set the characters up so that, 
I'm going to screw this clicker up as well. Yeah. Um, they, they set the characters up so they each follow a pathway uh, that's very, very familiar to character development uh, within Dungeons and Dragons. So there's a great Reddit thread uh, where each of the characters have their, their class and their race and their alignment and everything mapped out. And, and with, with that knowledge, you get a bit of a deeper understanding about this show. And we're going to talk about some of the aspects of Dungeons and Dragons and why I think it's a really powerful tool um, on those multiple layers, not just uh, for uh, thinking through scenarios and, and designing experiences and building products for our users, uh, but as, as Caitlin said, also for building teams that start to think in different ways and start to collaborate in different ways. So there's a few different layers to this. It's multi-level. I'm going to point it at you now. <laughs> All right. That's not it. That's not it. Yep. Yes, that is it. That is it. So I think one of the things that we are ultimately trying to do, right, is we're trying to solve different types of problem. And when you think about solving complex problems, here are some of the key issues that we think teams ultimately run into, right? A lot of times you'll get groupthink. So teams will ultimately spend more time trying to find the common ground and talk about what we all believe and share and have in common, as opposed to imagining all of the ways in which we disagree or all of the different components that we find interesting or the, the um, pathways and scenarios that we could ultimately um, see our products, our features, our innovation paths taking. I think the other piece of this too is in any given culture and team, you ultimately have a bit of hierarchy. And hopefully organizations have been, been able to manage that hierarchy well. But at the same time, how do you enable or ensure that every person from your entry level design team all the way through to your CTO share and contribute along a common pathway? Uh, the other thing that we think uh, Dungeons and Dragons and ultimately collaborative storytelling helps us solve is this idea of reduction and oversimplification. The, um, the sort of desire to take away the variables that we don't want to think about or the components that we ultimately feel like are too hard to manage or tackle. Uh, and then finally, loss aversion. Right? The fact that sometimes as companies and teams, we get too focused in on what's made us successful to date, that we don't want to let that go and put that behind in order to move forward and evolve. Right? And so this is where we're starting to play around with collaborative storytelling as a method to break us out of those types of traps. But how do you know when you've reached success? Right? Um, I think that that's a, a foundation of answering any problem, right? Is acceptance criteria, success criteria. Um, one of the ways in which we start to define success is understanding the probability and magnitude of different types of scenarios. So how big or how small and how often or how unlikely are these different scenarios um, uh, different scenarios going to be in your world moving forward. And that's important because that ultimately helps you to rank order your risks and work to mitigate them. So as a part of scenario planning, as a part of this sort of narrative structure, you're going to start to see many different decision trees branch out in front of you, right? And you need to start to say, is it worse for me to avoid hitting the tiny child or the group of adults, right? as a self-driving car example. And once you start to order those risks, you're better able to actually start to attack them because things are prioritized. But fundamentally, you must remember that success can take many different forms. That it's not just about a single outcome being defined as your success state, but a wide variety Right? And that's going to help you ensure that your users and your teams don't fail catastrophically when they don't meet you at that one single point, but that you've provided a range of different outcomes that allow them to be successful at the end of the day. I think um, Rocky here, so if you haven't seen Rocky by now, that's, that's on you, not on me. Um, I, I think 
this is a really great uh, reminder that success can take on many forms. Because how many how many people remember the outcome of the first or the the, the first film, the the boxing match? This yeah, is a young a audience. Young audience. All right, <laughs> it's a great film. Um, Oscar winning. Um, so Rocky doesn't actually win the fight, but not many people remember that outcome because of the jubilation and the sense of, of worth and success that Rocky had at the end of the match. It, the outcome doesn't really matter who wins or loses the boxing match. The fact was Rocky had a bunch of obstacles and he overcame them and so he succeeded even though everyone watching the match saw him lose. Split decision. Okay. Into the real nerdy stuff now. So, we think that in order to solve problems, you need a large variety of experiences. So, when my, my party and I are going on adventures, I've got some props here. Um, when we're going on adventures, if everyone looks the same as me and acts the same as me and thinks the same as me, then we're going to get the same outcomes, right? Um, this is going to be hard to find the page with the mic. Um, I really like a quote here at the very start of this book. So, who knows... Oh, who's seen this before? It's the player's handbook, right? If you're going to play D&D, don't worry, you don't have to read the whole thing. There's a condensed version that has like two pages of rules. But this, this tells you all the rules in how to play D&D from a player's perspective. But one of the things I really like here is it says, every character is different with various strengths and weaknesses. So the best party of adventurers is one in which the characters complement each other and cover the weaknesses of their companions. So if you're going on an adventure which all our users are, or all our design teams are, if you're going on an adventure, you don't want lots of the same ways of thinking, right? If everyone's a giant barbarian, then you've got really one outcome. Anything you see, you're going to try and punch, right? Whoever watched He-Man as a kid, he, his solution was just to punch everything, right? That, that's, that's all he could do. But the characters, we've got wizards, they can cast spells. We might have a bard who's charming. We might have... Uh, people who are going to heal you or some people that are better at fighting undead characters. It means that if the party is diverse and you have different ways of thinking, then you can tackle different problems and you can approach problems in different ways. It just gives you a, a broader set of, of opportunities. Um, I think it's, it's really uh, dangerous for all of us to get into a room and start to think about what our customers want or our users want because we're all kind of coming from a similar pathway, right? The fact that we ended up working at that company in that role at this time means that we've got a lot of stuff in common. Um, so let's mix the party up. Let's add some, add some barbarians and some wizards. And one of the things that you can start to do in your teams is actually assign people different roles when it comes to problem solving. And you can be very intentional intentional about making sure that those different roles are sometimes aligned with or sometimes in opposition of different people or roles on, on a team or in a brainstorming opportunity, just to make sure that people are reinforcing different points of view as opposed to running towards what everybody agrees on and has in common. All right, everything we do, there's rules, right? If, you, if you're building an application, there's a certain pathway through that application. There's rules that say if you go left, then this happens. If you go right, then that happens. But the, the best stories uh, sometimes unfold. And with Dungeons and Dragons, the only objective is to build the story. You don't win it. You can't really lose at it. Even if your character dies, you can start another one or, or, or someone will raise you from the dead, right? It, it's, not, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. But there are rules. What I really like, though, is... So the other, the other prop I have for you is this book. So if you're going to run the game, everyone's a player except for one person who's the dungeon master, right? It's their job to, uh, as, as this book will tell you, it's their job to adjudicate the rules. But importantly, page four, right at the start of the book, you adjudicate the rules, but you also modify them where it's suitable for your campaign. So we've got a set of rules. If you stick to them, you'll... You'll, you'll have a very linear uh, pathway. If you start to manipulate those rules and start to tweak them a little bit, throw out the ones that don't matter so much, or the ones that are not as applicable to you and your, your environment or your situation, then you'll start to get some of the more unusual outcomes. And it's the unusual outcomes that lead to better uh, experiences, better product development, better character development. 
So as an example, one of the exercises that our team likes to go through is for any given scenario or way that something might unfold, we ask ourselves, how does this get better? How does this get worse? And how does this ultimately get weird, right? How did the dynamics change so drastically that none of, that none of what we've thought of, that none of what we've planned for actually come to pass? And that helps us start to think outside of the box and move, move beyond just what our expected outcome might be. All right. So this, and this kind of ties back into the first point a little bit, right? It's very easy for me to behave and act as Matt Lambie. That's who I am. That's what I've been doing my whole life. But when, I, when I'm engaged in these kind of narratives and this storytelling, I need to remind myself that I'm, I'm supposed to behave as my character would. So if I have a certain preference or some, cert, some knowledge in the outside world, but my character doesn't have that, then I can't bring that into the game. I, I need to be the character, not the player. And I, I think that's a really important lesson with this, this narrative and, and storytelling. It's, again, very easy for me to act as me when I might be trying to represent a four-year-old autistic child who's using our product. Or I might be trying to represent a, 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 an aging businessman who doesn't spend enough time with his family. Uh, I can't bring either of those to the, the table if I'm playing as myself. I need to play as the character. And this should feel fairly familiar to you anytime you've picked up a book or a comic, read a newspaper article or a story. What the author is ultimately trying to get you to do is to jump into the shoes, jump into the world, jump into the emotions and the feelings and the sets of experiences that these characters are actually having. And what's beautiful in that experience as a reader is that it enables you to go on that journey. It enables you to feel all of those feelings with a bit of vermouth. Right? So it enables you to talk about the best case scenario and the worst without actually having to feel like you're going on the roller coaster that one might uh, go on in real life. Yeah, and we talk about alignment of characters, and it varies between sort of good and bad. It's, it's how you, you make sure that the party's not just full of everyone who obeys the law, you know, as we do here in Singapore. Where everyone's got a certain type of alignment. But the really interesting stuff happens when you throw a few bad guys in the mix as well. And so when you're doing your scenario planning or when you're starting to think about how people can use it, um, especially those that are kind of coming at it from a security perspective, you start thinking about how a bad guy might want to use this product or, or, or what, they, what their intentions might be. What pathways are they going to traverse through your product um, and so not just thinking about someone who's got good intentions all the time but maybe someone's got bad intentions or someone's trying to work against your intentions um, and how does that play out cool so again so many ways in which things are not just black and white um, again when you when you're playing Dungeons and Dragons you you don't ever really win the game there's no truth to it there's no there's no failure if you're progressing, if you're, sort of to, to use a, a, a term you like, if, if you're going to move the ball down the field, then you're progressing the story. And if you're progressing the story, then you're succeeding. And so I think that what's true for me and my character and the lens through which I view the world and the lens through which I operate uh, might not be true for someone else. And so we bring these facts to the table, but they're only a fact when viewed through the filter of my own lens and, and my interpretation. And what's great is you can often run through exercises. I know probably everybody has gone through a post-mortem, right? Where after you go through an experience, maybe a sprint, you ultimately talk about what worked well and what didn't go well so you can learn from it moving forward. But have you ever actually tried a pre-mortem? Or before you get into a scenario or before you get into an outcome, you actually say, let's talk about the time where this failed. Right? And you run through what that might look like before you're even there. And you give your per yourself the permission to imagine how these different events might unfold in a way that's not always as planned, that might not always achieve the outcomes that you set forward. But that also frees you up to think about problems from a different perspective. Yeah, we ran through this exact exercise at the Exco retreat only a couple of weeks ago, and it was jarring for, for Caitlin to present us with the idea of, okay, so it was good while it lasted, but now Money Smart's shut down, it's a failed business, what happened? And then we had to work backwards from that and, and consider scenarios that would lead us down a pathway that nobody in that room wanted to consider. Um, it, it's a really powerful tool and gets you thinking in, in these different ways, which is ultimately what the storytelling and, and this narrative uh, creation is supposed to do.
All right. Critical fail, critical hit. We're going to get a little nerdy. So chance gets introduced into the game through dice, right? Most of you are familiar with a D6. It's a six-sided dice. It gives you the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six. But in D&D, we have a whole variety of different dice. I've got some in that bag over there. I don't know. I thought they might be useful. Probably not. Um, we have a four-sided dice, which gives you the numbers one through four. And then it goes all the way up to a 20-sided dice, which gives you chance between 1 and 20. And there's a lot of variability in between there. So at the very ends of the spectrum, we've got a 1, which is a critical fail. And that means that if you're rolling a 1, what you tried to do, you didn't just miss it by a little bit. You didn't just you know, trip over. You, you screwed up big time, like big time. And there's going to be a catastrophic failure. There's going to be a catastrophic result attached to that failure. And equally, if you hit a nat what we call it a natural 20, so it's a 20 without any kind of modifiers to it. If you hit a natural 20, that's a critical hit. And equally, you get some pretty strong benefits from that. It might be you do additional damage. It might be some kind of heroic feat occurs as a result of that. But these are the extremes. And I think it's important that we look at the extremes, not just success and failure or following a happy path through a, a, a product or through a project. But what does it mean to have a critical hit? What does extreme success with the product or with the experience look like? And what does a, what's a critical fail? How do we recover from that? Um, if we start to consider these extremes, then all these happy pathways through the middle that we're so used to progressing through and, and planning for and designing for, then they become part of the spectrum rather than the, the, the well-traversed path. They just become one of 20 different options. And why I really love the dice is it's a tool, right? give yourself and your teams tools in order to explore these different scenarios, right? So say you're running down this narrative path, you're reimagining a different outcome. A tool that you might employ could be as simple as saying to your collaborator, zoom in, provide me more detail about what's happening in this moment or in this scenario, right? And that forces your collaborator to go one level deeper and to actually provide provide different levels of input and output to a given situation. Or you could say, zoom out, zoom out. And at that point in time, you're asking them, tell me about the 10,000 foot view. What are the trends and conditions that are ultimately coming together in order to make this part of your story come to life, right? Simple tools like that can reframe how people are explaining the different narratives or scenarios that they're imagining. All right, and like I said, there's no real end to this. I mean, D&D was first created in 1974. Um, it's, people have had games that have been running since 1974. Um, you'll often see at big sort of nerd conferences, there's, a, there's people in the corner playing the game. These things, it's like that long-running chess match that you sort of see as a bit of a, a trope. It's the same deal. You kind of drop in, you drop out. Um, I don't think you ever really stop playing. You might just take a pause from the game. We, we haven't had a session at Money Smart for probably six months now. Um, our dungeon master got himself a girlfriend and now he doesn't have as much time. Um, she plays as well, but uh, that's <laughs> that still doesn't want to DM for us. Um, it doesn't really stop though, right? It's a continuous journey. And I think when we're, when we're looking at, at building products or experiences, we think of it as having a start and a stop. Uh, maybe like you start from zero and then you progress through and you achieve, you, you buy, you transact, you, you, you play the track, whatever, it, whatever the utilization of that product is. But we don't think beyond that and we don't think before that and we don't think sideways of that. So instead of viewing time as being this linear kind of you march forward through the product or through the, the process, um, start thinking of it as something that's a little bit more elastic, something that you can kind of drop in of drop in and drop out of, something that maybe you might put down and pick up a little bit later. What does it mean to come back to an application after six months? What does it mean to come back to, to an app after 10 years of not having used it? Um, we, and we see this now. We're, we're at a point where applications like Facebook, I mean, it, it's been around for 20 years almost, right? Um, there, are, there are people that have not used it for the last 10 years and they're going to come back to it at some point. What does the product, what does the experience look like for those people that have got giant gaps, giant holes? 
And I think that this is a really wonderful point that Matt makes because at the end of the day, customer experiences don't happen in isolation. But thinking holistically about our consumer experience, thinking about what happens before and ultimately after a consumer engages with our product, our service, our feature, our functionality, can ultimately help us design a better uh, experience in situ. Okay, so are you guys with us so far? Have we, have we got you on our collaborative storytelling bandwagon? Maybe. Are you going to come on an adventure with us? Yeah. Okay. Just yes. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Who said that? Who was that? Yes. Yes. Um, so just to make sure, I think we all need to acknowledge that there are layers of complexity that ultimately threaten to overwhelm us. And in many instances, that's pushed us into a very reactive decision-making space, right? Um, a lot of times, our environments are actually designed to take advantage of us in those moments of exhaustion when we're overwhelmed by the complexity. Um, but at the end of the day, we really think that collaborative storytelling can really help us tackle some of those wicked problems that are ultimately threatening to consume our customers. And on that, just on this mm. image here, like this is, this is my work colleagues, these are my friends. Um, this is something we actually practice. Like we play Dungeons and Dragons and there's a, there's a, a real subtle benefit that it took me a little while to kind of pick up on. And once I did, I really, I really enjoyed it. And that's, during my day-to-day -day life at, at work, there's a few people on the team that I interact with a lot, and there's a lot of people that I don't interact with at all. And it's not for any reason other than my job kind of steers me in one way. Around the table here, we've got designers, we've got content writers, we've got technology people, we've got a whole variety of different, different roles within the organisation, and everyone's playing a different role in the party. I got the opportunity to solve problems, which is ultimately what we're doing, build story, bond, legitimate, real-world bonds with people that ultimately mean a lot to me. And it meant that the next day around the water cooler, we were talking about the adventure that we had the previous night. So I think Dungeons and Dragons as a tool for building teams and developing teams and growing teams is actually a, a, another aspect that um, I, I didn't want us to finish the speech or finish the talk without kind of highlighting. Um, if you get an opportunity to play it or to try it out, I'd really recommend it. That's a great point. Because at the end of the day, we think that this type of collaborative storytelling, this narrative building and scenario planning is ultimately what helps us create these environments that design for behavior change, yes, but design for behavior change in the positive and enable all of our users, our team members, our collaborators to succeed rather than fail catastrophically when they haven't hit our one designed or ideal outcome. Everyone. Okay, so then a couple of uh, takeaways for you to leave this talk with. Um, one, diversify your options, right? Um, whether or not decisions, black or white, A or B, decisions are more likely to end up in failed outcomes than if you increase multiple different scenarios and versions of what might be true, what could be true, and what ultimately will come true moving forward. The presence of difference ultimately makes insiders more open to difference, right? And in this instance, I think diversity trumps ability. Diversify your teams, diversify your skill sets, diversify the experiences that people come to the table with, the expertise that they bring to bear on any given situation. Because in doing so, you're ultimately opening up the world of outcomes and potentials, and you're making the world a lot bigger of a place. You're creating more decision trees and pathways forward that your users and your businesses and ultimately your products and services can traverse. And I think on that point, just before we skip, like the, the previous uh, presentation with the, hey, Google, Google, hey, Google, like, did, did any of the Google, do you think that that user is represented by anybody that works at Google? Have they got tens of thousands of, of employees? And I bet not one of them 
looks or thinks like that user. Cool. Um, and our final thought, I think, is that evolution really happens at the margins, right? Don't constrain yourself to the mainstream because that is the pathway that is well-trodden. Really look at the extremes of what's happening, what's out there, the different scenarios to the critical fail or critical hit, right, that allow you to imagine different trajectories, not just incremental or marginal gains. Thanks. Questions? All right, where's Ben Bose? Ben, where are you? This one's for you. Clap once if you're hungry. Let's try that again. Clap once if you're hungry. Clap twice if you really enjoyed that talk. I was expecting zero claps. <laughs> Clap thrice if you're really, really hungry. OK. Um, so we'll, we'll do an interesting Q&A session. We have some great questions lined up. Uh, the burning question of the room is, can you share an example slash case study from your experience whereby you've got a team to contribute conflicting ideas, avoided groupthink, and build from there? Who asked this wonderful question? Okay, the gentleman at the back. Um, so I'll give you a real world example. Matt alluded to a workshop that I held a couple of weeks ago. And I think within that workshop, what I did was assign different people roles so that at the end of the day, somebody was responsible for coming to the table with a perspective that is driven by their experience in Singapore. Another person was um, assigned a role uh, based on their experience in Indonesia. Another in Hong Kong. So you start to set up these in this instance, we set up geography as a catalyst for uh, difference and different decision making and priorities in order to say, this is what's going to be valuable in our marketplace here in Singapore. Conversely, um, what's, here's what's valuable or important for our marketplace in Indonesia. And as you might imagine, the need states there were quite conflicting. And the um, argument for priorities were quite conflicting. So at the end of the day, though, it helped us to start to think about what different um, outcomes must be true in order for us to succeed in a diverse region and a diverse set of marketplaces, given a single product or suite of products, as an example. Did that answer your question? To an extent, do you, want, do you want to follow that up? If you want clarification, let's do that. Two of your teammates have an opposing view on how to approach a problem. So it's not about different problems. It's the same problem, but there are two different approaches. Mm -hmm. And you don't have enough data to substantiate any one approach. Uh, is it more of a marginal call by the leader then? Mm. Or is it a, let's go out with both of these, test them out, uh, and see where they sit? So how do you approach that scenario? And how do you still keep people from voicing their opinions when they strongly feel about them? So that's a great question. I think at Money Smart, we have um, a strongly held belief that we need to engage, disagree, and then ultimately commit to the decisions that we make. So that engagement and disagreement is fundamental to our innovation process. So is the commitment piece as well, though, because once you run through that disagreement and you come to a consensus, everybody needs to start sort of moving towards that North Star that's been decided. But in your example, I think um, we start to rely on the art of rhetoric a bit. So everybody is allowed to sort of make their case and make an argument. Um, and then vice versa, I think what can be really helpful is ultimately asking people to switch sides. So you and I have opposing points of view. You're going to argue point A. I'm going to argue point B. And then we're going to flip. And that actually causes you to empathize and walk through what is um, valid in somebody else's argument, what's helpful, 
where there ultimately might be connectors, where you find emotional resonance, or where you see a company's strategic assets contributing to a different solution and outcome. And I think what starts to happen there is you um, understand how different pathways might be valid or might be true moving forward. So that when you get to that commitment stage, you're actually far um, more willing and ready to embrace somebody else's point of view as a tactic that we use. That's a great, great approach. Um, the next question, I first want to give it to the room and then we'll push it to the speakers. How many specialists in the room? Say hell yeah. What? Everybody's a generalist. So a specialist would be like a subject matter expert, right? Someone who has a niche uh, set of knowledge on, on a certain topic or a certain area. While a generalist would be who likes to dab into a lot of things. I am a, um, and a very outspoken generalist. I like to da uh, dab on a lot of things, even in product development. So who in the room is someone who is a generalist? Say hell yeah. Hell yeah. And who are these specialists? Say oh yeah. One more time. Generalists. Oh, yeah. And specialists? Oh, yeah. Okay. I will find you specialists. Uh, and let's put it to Matt and Caitlin. Maybe you can yeah. say who you uh, associate more with and why. Yeah, absolutely. So, and I can even tie it back to D&D &D for you. Um, I, I think at this point, um, when I'm putting teams together, I do tend to look more for specialists. But I think generalists play a very important role in those teams. Uh, I think... The generalist I often see is the glue that kind of can bind a team together and the specialist is it gives you capacity to go deeper on, on different, uh, different problems. So an example for this, um, in, the, in the, the game I play a character that's a fighter. Yeah, pretty general term, right? Um, we've got characters that are barbarians that are way stronger, that are way bigger, that are way more powerful. Uh, but as a fighter, I'm a bit of a generalist. I've got some good combat skills, I've uh, got a little bit of magic, but I'm not as strong in any one of those skills as other characters or other, other, other characters in the game. So I, I think, again, if you bring to the table only specialists, then sometimes they can be a bit hard to corral. Um, and I think the generalists, in, in my opinion, can be really binding and, and can be the glue that, that keeps those teams together. Um, again, I think a mix of everything is going to give you more capacity to solve more problems. Um, I tend to think about team structures and in the individuals that I'm looking to build out from a T-shaped perspective. Is anybody familiar with the idea of T-shaped employees? Yeah. Um, so the idea being that when you are new into your career and you are in the process of developing your craft practice and discipline, you are in the process of making your T, the long bar in your T, deep. It is building out your benchmark um, or your bench of tools and process and it is owning those tools and process um, that makes you very valuable and um, sort of all-encompassing in your craft. Then as you start to get more senior, I think you start to build out the horizontal bar in your T. So you start to get cross-discipline experience and understanding so that you start to have crossover with your technology partners or your content partners or your product partners so that you can empathize and understand and, and ultimately um, start to contribute to their deliverables along the same sort of horizon. Again, know your craft practice and your discipline. Be confident and comfortable in that because that's ultimately um, the strength of what you bring to the table. But also then to Matt's point about becoming glue, make sure that you're building in those sticky arms so that you can jump into and support any of your multidisciplinary team members. Okay, so there was a great follow-up question. Do you then promote the specialists or generalists to a management role? Who is this wonderful person? Because I think people who ask burning questions in the room are often very successful. Oh, can we, can we see your beautiful face? There she is. Okay, do you want to yeah, take that? Yeah, so, so my answer to this is really simply yes. Yes, we do promote specialists or generalists to a management role. Um, I, I don't think they need to be one or the other. Uh, I think that management, you can have specialists that are capable in, of managing teams really well and you can have generalists that are capable of managing teams. And we see this in technology, I think, more maybe than, than other disciplines. Um, some of the, the smartest, most capable technologists are not great at management. 
Um, and they might not have the people skills or they might not have the interests. They want to just go very, very deep. Um, so I think the, the, the idea that we only promote people that are specialists or people that are generalists is, it means you're missing out on, on a large, large potential for the rest of your team. I mean, maybe to throw it back, do you think that only specialists or generalists should be managers? He's a tough presenter, isn't he? Justify your question. <laughs> um, I guess personally, I feel like generous, generalists would, would more necessarily be work better in a managerial role just because that they can see like the full spectrum of who and what they're managing. But I could be wrong. <laughs> it's I, I'd argue, yeah, you're, you're not wrong. I'd argue that that's, uh, that's an approach. Um, and I think if we, to sort of make it a little meta, if we, if we only go down one pathway, then we'll get one set of results and one set of possibilities. Oh, we've got teams uh, at Money Smart where the managers are specialists and we've got teams where the managers are, are generalists. And each team has the potential to succeed in different ways and each, each of the team members uh, gets something different from, from their managers. I don't think it needs to be a cookie cutter approach across every team. And different people will find managers, uh, in technology is a great example, where you might want someone who's a, a specialist because the, the management that you're requiring is, is very technical. Um, you want more mentorship. Um, and if someone's got a, a deep knowledge on a specific topic, then they might be the better, better suited to mentor you. Amen. Okay, um, let's take one more question from Slido. How can the Money Smart team truly represent users if it's based on assumption? Imagine what X would need. I have an answer to that. Um, so I think the, 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 to kind of lawyer the question here is the assumption. So we have a team, one person at the moment, um, who, who does a lot of great user research. Um, so I don't think we're, we're actually having to make the assumptions. Um, I think we can, we can rely on data to build personas and then you can put the hat of that persona and you can become Ian or Julia or Anna or or whoever, whoever the persona is that we've built. And so it's not just an assumption of imagine what they would do. We've got really good data to support that this is what that, that character is, this is where they're at at their life, these are the decisions they're making, these are the, the, the assets and, and the factors that are, that are contributing to that decision-making process. So I think if you are just making assumptions by saying imagine what that user would do, then you're, you're not doing the process justice. You need to really be that, that person. In order to be that person, you need to understand the persona. I couldn't agree with Matt more. I think it's really about using data to springboard forward because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is forecast where our consumer need is ultimately emerging. Right? And we're trying to forecast where the marketplace is headed and what types of new technology we'll be able to use at our disposal in order to solve the problems that our customers have to date. And so from that perspective, we're always anchoring in what's happening right now and what does that tell us in the dotted line of the future about the myriad outcomes or scenarios that we might ultimately face moving forward. Because at the end of the day, if you're just too anchored in today, then you're solving the problems that are right in front of your face, as opposed to solving the problems that you're going to see emerging tomorrow and the day after. Awesome. Okay, on a count of three, two, one, I want to see a hand if there's any question on the floor. Otherwise, we can all break for lunch. Three, two, oh, man. <laughs> we love you. We love you. Okay, hi, my name is Weiman. Uh, I play D&D, and I also facilitated tabletop role-playing games. Yeah. And Let's give a, a round of applause for that. <laughs> and as a UX designer, I always think about how I can modify the game mechanics to kind of solve product problems. So what I want to know is how you have done it, if you have done it. Um, and yeah, I would like to hear how you've done it. <laughs> That'd be really interesting. Sorry, was it how have we modified the game mechanics? Yes, to yeah. solve a product problem, like are, are the players users, what is the problem all of them are trying to solve, yeah, things like that. You've got one minute to answer this question. Oh. <laughs> okay, um, so I think uh, the, the rules are there to guide you, right? Um, and I think that the, if, we, if we stick to the rules and we play a very strict game, 
than as a, as a dungeon master yourself. Um, it's a surefire way to get the players off site. Um, I think that there needs to be a real flexibility and there needs to be a, a, a sense of uh, ownership of the, the problem that, that you're tackling with the, with the users or with the, with the players. I think all too often uh, product teams or technology teams can see the users in this adversarial way. And so I think the, as in they're, they're trying to do something with our, our, our product, but they're just too slow, stupid, <laughs> whatever, the, whatever the problem is, there's some kind of impediment there. So I think one of the real things we can do is change this adversarial relationship that we have with our users and realize that we're, we're kind of sitting on the same side of the table as them, right? When you're a DM, you're not trying to compete against the players. You're not trying to kill them. You're not trying to ruin their day. You're trying to enjoy a glass of wine and tell some stories together, right? Um, and so I think the, the, the teams in the real world can start to change their perspective and see that they're part of the user's journey and that together they can create that story rather than it being adversarial. And I think that's a, a mindset change that I've kind of brought. Is that resonating with anyone, or am I just saying adversarial too many times? <laughs> I, think, I think that is resonating with everyone, with the broad silence that we have. Everybody is hungry. Um, so we have a bunch of great talks lined up after lunch. So let's eat, rejuvenate ourselves, and be back in this room. Thank you, everyone.